Okay, perfect. We are live. Hello, everyone. I am excited. We are going to be talking about executive function and ADHD today with Michael from Grow Now Therapy. And as soon as I see that he pops on here, I'll add him and we'll get started. Hello to those who are here so far. Just waiting until I can see Michael to admit him and then we should be good to go. Just waiting. Don't mind my appearance here. It's been kind of a long day. I don't know if everyone else has had like a crazy long week and it's only Wednesday, but that's about it's about where I'm at. Going to message here. Here we go. All right. Hey, hey there we, we did go. it. I was going to say, I was afraid. When I'm at home, I can have my own technology set up, and I know with fidelity, things are going to go well. So being here at my in-laws, I'm like. Oh, that's where you are. Yes, I am in my in-laws' house, but I found a place that is quiet, and we've got Wi-Fi, and we are good to go. Okay, in a secret little room. Yes, it's got some nice antiques that uh i <laughs> a little creepy but they're cool okay is your dog there too he is with my husband okay if he was here with me we would not be able to hear each other <laughs> but, but it should be good yeah and my my baby's upstairs as well so <laughs> she won't be she won't be causing any noise no worries i'm it doesn't bother me at all so okay all right well, this is awesome. This is so cool that we're doing this. Uh, I'm so glad we have a couple of people here now and people are joining. Uh, and, and I'm so happy that, that you know, you, you had this idea. I don't, I don't remember who had the idea, you or me. Uh, but this is, this is awesome. I'm, I'm so glad that you connected, you reached out to me, and here we are. Uh, yeah, I am so stoked. And anyone who's ever been to lives that I sit here and host, I am very chill and laid back. I usually have a couple of questions to make sure we cover an hour. Not that that's ever an issue. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so it's it's always nice to be laid back and relaxed. It doesn't have to be an, another grad school lecture or people throwing crazy information at you. It's all about, you know, making it relatable. Exactly. And you have always been just that relatable. So I think everyone here today is in for a big treat. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm excited. So will you just give everyone who may not <clears throat> already know who you are a little bit of a, a self preview? <laughs> a self preview. I like that. All right. So uh, my name is Michael McLeod. I'm a speech and language pathologist. I specialize in ADHD and executive functioning. I have a private practice out here in Philadelphia. Uh, so, so basically uh, what I'm doing now is I, I have my private practice where I work with a lot of middle school, high school, college age, and college grad students uh, specializing in that ADHD and executive functioning. I really love to highlight the connection between ADHD and language. Uh, and a lot of the most up-to-date research really shows that connection. Um, and I've really coined the term internal language. Uh, so a lot of what I'm doing now is really coaching SLPs to really do the same. Because so I would love to see fellow SLPs like yourself, go-getters like yourself, uh, <laughs> really, really becoming uh, leaders on the ADHD treatment team. Uh, I think all of us SLPs out there, I think the majority of our audience is SLPs, I would probably say. Uh, you know, we're, we're that profession where people have no idea what an SLP is. Mm -hmm. And yes, yesterday was SLP day. Uh, uh, <laughs> so quite the coincidence. But you know, it, I can't tell you how many presentations I've done for incredibly, incredibly smart people, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, and they'll say, Oh, you're a speech therapist. I thought you just work on articulation. I thought you just work on stuttering. 
and you have to teach them the whole speech and language. And ADHD really falls within that language aspect. It's the internal language. And if we can get to the point where in grad school, you know, we learn about expressive language, receptive language, uh, social pragmatic language, written language, reading language. If we can finally add that internal language piece and SLPs can be empowered to be leaders on the ADHD treatment team, that that's my goal. Hey, and I <laughs> am already like, you know, I've shared a couple of my experiences already just after being able to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a game changer because it really is the core deficit. And sometimes we just don't know what it is. And when you hit that, I don't, it's almost been magic. It's not really magic because it's just doing what works, right? It's doing it, what it, works. It, exactly. Executive functions are really the foundation for everything. Like, for example, you look at a lot of uh, the pre-voice pre uh, milestones for babies a lot of it is executive functioning in terms of eye contact and, and attention span uh, and, you know, pro object permanence, uh, it, all of those things. Uh, so e executive functioning and language are highly tied together. Um, and a lot of uh, ADHD worldwide professionals like Dr. Russell Barkley, Sarah Ward, a fellow SLP, are really starting to highlight that ADHD language connection. And, uh, it, you know, I I'm a big advocate for SLPs, like I've already said. And I, I truly believe that eight, that SLPs can be leaders uh, towards ADHD and, and ADHD uh, diagnoses are really skyrocketing over the past couple of years and executive functions are becoming a real buzzword all over education. And I, I think SLP should be, should be the go-to, the go-to clinician. That makes me excited. And I'm sure people here who don't know a lot about it are probably feeling a little bit of pressure, but I hope by the end of this, giving them a little bit more of a teaser since we can't cover everything in an hour, but then even directing them to your page that has so much good information for, I mean, implications for practice. I think people are going to feel very well equipped or not. I mean, as well equipped as you can, you know, as a beginner, but I think there's such a great amount of information that you can apply tomorrow or to start implementing tomorrow that it's, it's going to be so fun. I'm excited for all these people who like me are just thirsty for more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is this is all really, you know, it, it's the most up to date research. Uh, there's been an incredible research done by the Harvard Center of the of the developing child. There's a lot of SLPs that are really now getting, getting into executive functioning and ADHD and have been for quite some time. So this is really exciting stuff. Uh, and it's really treating the internal root cause. A lot of the times we really look at these external symptoms and think, okay, how can we provide accommodations? How can we alter the environment? But if we teach internal skill building, internal skill acquisition, we're really treating the root cause. We're really treating that area of weakness instead of always taking that strength-based approach. Strength-based approach are crucial for building rapport and getting engagement and those sorts of things. But when we really treat that area of weakness and turn it into a strength, that's when we can really focus on long-term growth and carry over from the, the SLP sessions. Absolutely. And that independence. I always love the word independence because that's always, right, our end goal. And I feel like so many times, especially for me being a school-based practitioner, there so many times the answer is just accommodations. And it is mm -hmm. helpful, almost like a Band-Aid, though, and it, it can sometimes close the gap, but there's never that independence that kids need. I mean, outside of school, after school. And so I love, 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 love that component. Yep. So, so that's exactly it. So all of the goals that I have for my ADHD and executive functioning students, every single goal is written fading prompts towards independence. There's no 80% accuracy, 90% accuracy. It's all about independence. So the way we measure executive functioning is how prompt dependent is this student? And of course, it's based on age norms and where they're at. And of course, every, every goal has to be appropriate. But it's all about the student being able to do these things independently without reminders from others acting as their frontal lobe. Exactly. I love this. Some of these things that you're discussing are like, I mean, simple in theory. <laughs> they're not mm -hmm. as you know, it may sound, but it's so powerful to understand that little piece. Mm-hmm. Patients are just I don't have words. You just everyone <laughs> you try it and you'll see what we're talking about. So Absolutely. Try it. 
Yep. We will definitely get more in depth. It's a lot of information. Uh, I know you got a lot of great questions uh, from, from your Instagram followers. So, so yeah, let's, let's dive in. Okay. I'm going to, let's see. I tried to break them up. I sent you the list, but I tried to break them up kind of into categories because I felt like in a way people asked certain categories of questions, some of which we've kind of already gone over. Some people just said, I really don't even know what executive functioning is. Mm. What is it or what is it not? Same thing with ADHD. Some people were like, I'm just so confused. What is it? What is it not? That's an excellent question. Uh, so there are many, many different ways to describe executive functioning and ADHD. To start with executive functioning, executive functioning is basically like the air traffic controller of the brain. So it's all about just organizing all the incoming information, organizing all the stimuli, having everything organized and making sure everything's moving smoothly, uh, everything's together, uh, things are arriving on time, departing on time, everything is just happening smoothly and you're in control and you are, you are not uh, dependent on external stimuli to make sure everything's moving smoothly. Uh, so that's always really, really important uh, to remember that it's, it's all about internal organization to make sure that everything externally is moving smoothly. Uh, with ADHD, it was very recently that we now know the connection between ADHD and executive functioning. So there's a lot of misinformation out there that can say, oh, executive dysfunction and ADHD are two very different things. They're really not. ADHD is a disorder of the executive functioning system. We now know that to the point now where there's many, many different professionals, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists that don't even refer to it as ADHD or ADD anymore. They refer to it as executive functioning de developmental delay, EFDD, and some refer to it as self-regulation deficit disorder. Uh, so ADHD and ADD and ADD are really sort of getting very outdated because those labels really came to the forefront way a long time ago when we focused on these external symptoms. So ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, kids who couldn't sit still, kids who were very hyperactive. Then there's ADD, the ADHD inattentive type, and kids who couldn't focus, kids who couldn't maintain their attention. So we're, so we're looking at kids who were, who, who were lazy, kids who were unfocused, and kids who were hyperactive. And we are always just focused on the external, how they look externally, how they're presenting amongst their peers. But now we know because of MRI studies, CT studies, brain scan studies, that the home of ADHD, the true deficit of ADHD, is the prefrontal cortex of the brain right here behind uh, the forehead. And it's those areas that are slow to develop. There's uh, less uh, release of endorphins such as dopamine. It's released at lower rates. It's harder for them to, to, to really follow through on their executive functioning system. So instead of looking at hyperactivity and inattentiveness, it's really important to look at the internal skills that are delayed, that are deficits. So we're not looking at hyperactivity. We're not looking at inattentiveness. We're looking at executive functions. So what is ADHD and executive dysfunction? It's the ability to self-regulate, self-motivate towards non-preferred tasks, which is key because kids with ADHD and executive dysfunction can motivate towards preferred tasks. Uh, Self-evaluation, the ability to learn from past experiences and apply it to the present. And it's all based in internal language or self-talk. So what's really missing in kids with ADHD and executive dysfunction is this internal language piece. And what is internal language? Internal language is two core foundational skills um, called nonverbal working memory and verbal working memory. So nonverbal working memory is the foundation for all executive functioning. All executive functioning starts with nonverbal working memory. And this is basically the visual imagery system of the brain, the area of the brain that allows you to hold an image in mind, manipulate it, uh, create mental movies, re-image the relevant past, forecast the future, build that cause and effect thinking, and really go from like one solid picture, like a Google image, to a full HD working mental movie. And that's a really crucial for executive functioning. And then verbal working memory is the self-talk system, the brain coach system, where you're having an internal dialogue and you have an internal system of checks and balances 
where you're stopping and having an internal dialogue first, which allows you to self-regulate, self-motivate, self-evaluate, and you're, comp and you're using that in harmony with the images from non-verbal working memory, and you are becoming more and more independent in your daily tasks. I was there like, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of information. Yes, but so good. Even the way you condensed it. I mean, I think we got a lot of bang for our buck for that one question. <laughs> there you go. So, that was a lot of bang for your buck. All right. I'll sign off. <laughs> I'm done. Are we done, people? Should we just let him go? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> See, that was just the hook. Now everyone understands there's something for us to do. Now people there you go. And, okay. the, and yep, and, and we highlighted that language connection, which nobody can do better than the SLPs out there. So, you know, SLPs are masters at rapport building. They are masters of engagement. They're masters of motivation. You know, nobody builds rapport like an SLP, period. And of course, I'm biased. But <laughs> SLPs are so good at, at getting any age involved in what they're doing, building that rapport, building that engagement. This is No one does it like an SLP. And the true SLPs that get in the field, with the, with the right mindset, the right heart, they do it. And that is exactly what's needed. And if we're treating the core deficit of mental movies and the brain coach, and we're working on the internal language piece, we can really uh, create some really great things for our kids. Absolutely. Oh, I feel like sometimes <laughs> I don't even follow up with anything because I'm just so every time you give this information, and you've told me this multiple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just clicks every time. And it works when everyone tries it, which I hope you all do. It just works because you're fine. I don't know. I have so many of these kids, right? That I don't know that they're necessarily ADHD, but they still demonstrate some of these executive function delays or deficits and just still targeting that root cause. These kids are suddenly going from, I mean, it impacts more than language, right? It impacts every aspect of their life in school and their social relationships. And then the teachers are like, what, what happened to this kid? Exactly. They can self-regulate. They can yep. self-regulate. And this whole idea of self-regulation has been so fun to teach to my teachers because that's generally who I'm working with and teach to some parents. And they're just like, that's really the problem with my kid? <laughs> <laughs> that's know? exactly what it is. Yeah. And, and executive function skills are a greater indicator for success than academics. And executive function skills are needed to perform academically. So in terms of executive functioning, I like to put my goals in terms of realms. So there's executive functioning in the home, which requires a lot of parent coaching to create structure. These kids need a lot of structure in the home and, you know, school towards, you know, towards motivating towards the academic tasks as well as social. So another part of the ADHD language connection is the social pragmatic aspects of ADHD. So we've been throwing these kids into a lot of social groups that are unbelievably ineffective, that are run by people, you know, teaching them to speak like themselves. But at, at its core, it's executive function skills. So you really need to figure out exactly what's happening and what's the core deficit. I'm looking. I'm really bad at checking comments, but I'm checking them. Yeah, we're, we're getting some. Let's see. I see that someone, someone says, this is so great, and I agree. And then someone else just said, as a parent um, of a child with nonverbal learning disability with areas and executive functioning issues, I find it difficult to find information to help me and educators know what to do to help him. Well, she, she has come to the right place. So I'm assuming that's a, that's a she. Yep. So, uh, uh, so, so definitely, I'm, I'm very glad she, uh, she's here. Uh, you know, feel free to DM us afterwards. Uh, and we'll be able to share this information because if, if there's a nonverbal learning disability, that's basically, that's executive functioning. You know, there's, there's, you know how the, there's so many different terms, you know, like ADHD is, you know, rejection, sensitive dysphoria, oppositional defiance disorder, self-regulation. There's so many ridiculous labels. Nonverbal learning disability is executive functioning. It is a weakness of nonverbal working memory. So they have difficulty holding images in mind and creating images in their head. And that's what's causing this learning disability, this learning difference. Uh, so that, that core symptom needs to be treated. The ability to hold images in mind and you know, start with something small and add more and more detail and work, work with them on mental movies and, and, and just make sure they're getting targeted therapy for th those nonverbal skills. 
And I feel like not that we have to hit this today, because this could be alive all by itself. But even, you know, sometimes what that looks like, sometimes people are like, oh, that makes sense. But like, what what do I do? No, oh, yes, yes. Like? So if you want, you can give an example, or we can say, we'll do it another time, because that could warrant. <laughs> yes. Know, so, so the number one thing with ADHD is you always want to tailor it to the individual student. So, you know, uh, Sarah Ward has some incredible uh, treatment protocols for nonverbal learning. She has her get ready, do done model. So it basically has the three boxes of get ready, do done. And a lot of kids think you have to start with get ready, but really we teach them to start with done. We teach them to start with done so they can plan backwards so that they can execute forwards. So instead of starting with getting ready and getting all their materials ready, because what they end up doing is they get a couple of materials ready and then they get distracted and they stop. We teach them to start with done. And by starting with done is you start with what does being done look like? So we teach them to create a, a picture in their head of what does it look like to be done with their assignment? What does this look like when it's done when you submit it on, on Google Classroom? What does this essay look like when it's finished? So we teach them to draw a picture, take five minutes and close their eyes and make a mental movie and describe it to us. And then you have to follow up with a long list of reflexive questions to get details from that mental movie. And these kids love reflexive questioning because there's no right or wrong answer. It's all based on their questions. And these kids hate being wrong. They hate sucking at things. They hate being bad at things. They don't want to do anything new. So when you're asking uh, reflexive questioning, it's all details uh, from their mental movie. Uh, so anytime you're able to ask them those questions and get details about what they pictured, you know, what, where, what room were you in? What did you have with you? What were you wearing? Where did you submit it? What does the paper look like? Uh, how many pages was it? Uh, did you have a snack with you? Were you? Was someone else with you when you were doing it? Just have them just describe, describe, describe. If they're younger, you can have them draw a picture. If they're really, really good on the computer, like a, like a lot of ADHD kids are, they can make an image online. Uh, it's all about being creative and using your improv skills, which I also believe SLPs are quite good at. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. In general, that is definitely the case. <laughs> mm -hmm. Got to think on your feet. Yes. And I love between you and also Tara Sumter, who talks about um, reflexive questioning all the time. Mm -hmm. Such a good crucial. tool. Such a good tool. Just like you said, and I attest to exactly what you just said. My kids who have ADHD and even some that I guess don't have that particular label and just come in with executive function difficulties. If it's hard, they don't want to do it. If they're wrong, they're like, I'm done for today. You know, but it was like with reflexive questioning, you're helping, you're supporting, and they're never wrong. And they think it's great. They love to talk as long as they're not wrong. And the fact that's, that a, that's exactly what it is. So, so a lot of these kids, the, the, the thing you really want to know about kids with executive dysfunction is they, they get a lot of negative feedback all the time. Uh, so that's really, um, they, they hate being wrong. They hate trying new things. It's really, really difficult for them. So reflexive questioning is something I've always used in my therapy, whether it's executive functioning or language-based, because it's all based on them. And it's all based on, on their interests and, and their mental movies and their experiences. And uh, you know, ADHD causes a lot, a lot of difficulty. It causes difficulty with cause and effect thinking. Like these kids have difficulty learning from the past and applying it to the present, or knowing if they do something, if they, if they get dysregulated and angry in the moment, What's going, to, what's going to be the effect of that? Am I going to hurt people's feelings? Am I going to get in trouble? They don't know how to build that internal connection. Um, and, in terms of, and also with ADHD, there's great difficulty with time management and overall organization. These kids just don't do these things naturally that individuals with ADHD, with, without ADHD do without even thinking about. So when you're asking, asking reflexive questioning, uh, it's, you know, it may seem so simple. It may seem like you're just asking them basic questions, but when you're getting them to think about the details and you're getting them to think about time passing, how things were organized, how things looked in the past, how they look now, how it affected their environment, how it, how it affected others, you're building these, these, the cause and effect thinking internally. Which I love because we all assume, I think a lot of the times that they do think about those things because we think about those things subconsciously. Absolutely. And so I love that you're just 
scaffolding it until that internal voice becomes their internal voice. And then these kids just, and in my case, have just like bloomed. Not that they didn't bloom before, but they've bloomed in a way that other people can see that there is a difference and they're happier and they're more willing, sometimes still with support to try new things and hard things, but they're just different in the best of ways and they're happier. It's really fascinating. Just about, I would say 99% of my students that I work with, my high school, college age students, like I'll, I'll basically ask them. So like, you know, how often do you, you know, talk to yourself? How often do you have an inner dialogue? How often do you talk to your brain or talk to your heart? And they, they basically like, I, I never do that. I, 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 don't have, I don't have an inside voice. I don't talk to myself. And it's amazing how outright they are. Like, I never talk to myself. I never do these things. But people, and, it's, and it's, there's such a stark contrast between, because people without ADHD, with strong executive functioning, age-appropriate age, uh, executive functioning, do this constantly. From the moment they wake up, that internal voice begins. I need to brush my teeth so I can get out the door by six and I could get in the car. I might hit a little bit of traffic. I'll get to work by eight. If I get there a little early, I can work on this. I can do this. And we, we do this in milliseconds. But this is why these kids are stuck in the now. This is why they have no time management, no organization, and no cause and effect thinking because there's no internal dialogue. There's no internal voice. And it's all language based. And so ADHD is a disorder of internal language. There's no internal dialogue. There's no internal system of checks and balances. There's no internal images. There's no internal voice. And this causes a lot of problems. And that's why these kids are now versus not now. They're stuck in the now. They care about the present. And this is why they get so addicted to video games and screens and technology and things that give them that instant dopamine drip because they're so focused on what makes me happy now? What gets me stimulated now? What gets me motivated now? Because they can't think an hour down the line, two hours down the line of, oh, I'm not going to have time to finish my homework. I'm not going to have time to go outside. I'm not going to have time to eat. You know, a lot of these kids, they, 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 they do, are not able to future plan. Exactly. <laughs> these things that we all take for granted, I feel like that's the best part of this is just opening our own eyes to realize how much maybe we take for granted. Mm -hmm. Explicitly help facilitate. And I love that we just covered, especially in that part, a lot about that verbal working memory, right? For that internal voice. And I see that someone wrote down here a question, does nonverbal working memory include abstract thoughts or just visual imagery? Um, th th that's a really good question. So it really depends on the individual's strength and severity of executive dysfunctioning. So there tends to, so with ADHD, there tends to be a three year lag in executive functioning. So for example, if you're uh, 10 years old, your true executive age is really around seven. So you minus a, you minus three years from your actual age to get more of your executive age. And we have to remember the, the brain grows from back to front. And the front of that, the front, the, the prefrontal cortex is the home of executive functioning. And it's not fully developed until about 25, 26 years old. But you, you want to see where a kid is at development, developmentally and, and maturation wise. Um, so you really want to see the individual because, you know, it, they may be able to come up with abstract thinking. They may be able to, you know, re-image their favorite YouTube video in their head, their favorite TikTok video in their head, their favorite whatever in their head. And that's, you know, a little bit of abstract thinking. But you need to see what's appropriate for their age. So are they in high school? And should they be able to picture themselves taking a test the next week? Should they be able to picture themselves studying while they're in school before they even get home? You know, you really need to think about the quality and the importance of what's happening in their head. So, yes, abstract thinking and uh, visual imagery are two parts of nonverbal working memory, but it's all based on their age and their executive age. Love it. Let's see. I'm like, as you're talking, going through all of these other good comments and questions. This one I didn't have on my other list. How often does ADD or ADHD? You get missed in bright girls? Ooh, that is a great question. So this is a very similar problem in autism. So in autism, uh, autism in girls very often gets overlooked because uh, a lot of girls with autism have excellent language. 
uh, excellent social skills or just a little bit of awkwardness. And there's a lot of internalization. And these girls kind of hold in their anxiety and they hold in their thoughts and fears and they hold in their awkwardness. And it really creates a lot of problems down the road. And I think we see a lot of that in ADHD. Uh, but one thing you very commonly see with ADHD is these kids have really, really strong IQs. So you have a lot of kids that are 2E, twice exceptional, that also have ADHD. Uh, so, so many of these kids, I, I would say just about 90 to almost all of the kids in my practice are incredibly strong academically. It's just a matter of them being able to regulate and motivate towards the non-preferred academic classes. Uh, so in terms of uh, ADHD getting missed in bright girls, uh, sometimes, you know, the way our education system is set up, you can really get by pretty, pretty darn far with just your IQ and just your ability to, you know, pass some tests and get really good grades. And an IEP team or a 504 team may never actually, you know, take notice of you. You know, a lot of these problems may be at recess, the playground, or non-structured tasks, or whatever it may be, or at home even. Uh, so uh, it, I, if it does get overlooked in any population, I would say uh, bright girls would be at the top of the list. I would agree. And part of what you're saying too, which again, warrants like its own conversation. Again, being a school-based practitioner and seeing how relevant this is, sometimes it's difficult because the qualification or the eligibility criteria is so specific and so based on, you know, like test scores, or even though at least in our field, we can use more informal data. It's mm -hmm. just, hard because I feel like IDEA doesn't other than, you know, maybe OH, other health impairment for ADHD, you may or may not get picked up, you know, for services or supports, even if you need it. Yep. Because yep. This cookie cutter eligibility type student that they, yep. I don't know. It's just hard because IDEA, I don't think is quite moved yet. And that, that's a total opinion. Everyone who's listening, this is just me as a slightly frustrated school-based practitioner that I wish sometimes we could move to see. Now we know why a lot of these students are struggling, but our system doesn't always allow us to easily provide the help that they need. Exactly. And, and, le and let's be realistic. Most school districts, public school districts, even private schools, tend to have one or maybe even two, mostly one, quite underappreciated speech and language pathologist with an incredibly high caseload of kids who really stand out externally. So if you have one girl who's incredibly bright and gets overlooked because a lot of the symptoms are internalized or they're social, but they're getting straight A's on everything and there's no problems with standardized testing, there's no problems with academics, it's going to be quite hard for them to get services the way the system's currently set up. Exactly. Which... <laughs> We, we can have another discussion if people ever want to hop on with us and have a discussion about what we want to do to help that situation. But exactly. <laughs> yeah. Some questions that we can actually provide answers to because I, <laughs> I know how frustrating it is to come to things like this and want information and then have a question that we just can't answer. So let's let's do some questions that we can answer. Let's do it. OK, let me go through this list. We went over a lot of these um, general questions. Okay, I've got a lot of questions from different people in different settings that also work with a variety of different ages. I think I have three or four questions about people that say I work with like preschool age populations. What can I do starting with these kids in preschool? That's a, that is an excellent, excellent question. So I hit on this before in terms of actual age and executive age. So these kids tend to get identified when they really stand out from the pack, number one, in terms of not being able to participate in circle time, not being able to follow through on tasks, not uh, fitting in with their peers socially, having a lot of emotional breakdowns. You know, kids that, and, and the most important thing is it has to be a, a chronic issue, something that's happening constantly, you know, Monday through Friday, every single week. Okay, something's going on with the student, okay? So once we identify the student, number one, uh, one of the most important things we want to look at is, are they starting to, in any way, having any sort of internal voice? Are they even aware that internal voice is a skill? 
Do they know it's a strategy they can use? So we want to really use those terms, you know, brain coach with them. With a lot of my younger students, I'll have them come up with a name for their brain coach. They'll, they'll name it. They'll say, oh, my brain is Jeremy. My brain is, is whatever. Uh, and they'll talk to their brain. They'll have conversations. We draw pictures together. And you want them to become aware that you can have internal language. So uh, internal voices really start to come between the ages of five and seven. That's when external self-direction becomes privatized internal self-direction between the ages of five and seven. So that's really, you know, kindergarten age. Uh, so you really want to be aware of, do they know that they can speak to themselves? How can I model it for them? How can I externalize my internal language? Like all the times I'm talking to my brain and I do it naturally, when I'm working with a young student, I'm externalizing that. I'm modeling my internal voice. I'm modeling my brain coach for them constantly. So they hear me and they'll say, oh, who are you talking to? Oh, I'm just talking to my brain. I'm showing you how I'm talking to my brain. I'm showing you how I use my brain coach. So you want to model it for them. You want to make them aware of it. You want them to draw pictures so they can start to inter uh, internalize the pictures and the visuals. A lot of those reflective questioning that we talked about. Uh, so you really, you know, it's, you want it to be play-based at that age. Of course, you want it to be very play-based and engaging. Uh, but the most important thing is just building that awareness. I love it. And I love that you hit on that shift between kids. Like sometimes little kids, right? They talk to themselves. I mean, sometimes I talk to myself when I really need it, you know, like out loud too. But even little kids do it more where they're not necessarily narrating, but they're like, uh-oh, that could be hot. That could be dangerous, you know, and they yep. out loud. And then there yep. is a shift where it goes into their head and they're able to regulate. And then sometimes I just see – and if there are speech language pathologists that really love play and those milestones, I think a lot of them go really closely when they're narrating, you know, what characters are doing or, uh Oh, he's going to fall down. That's going to hurt. You know, things like that modeling too. Like, I'm like, that is going to become their internal voice, whether exactly they're on other objects or to themselves. Cause usually I feel like what they're narrating to objects, they first experience themselves. Exactly. So, oh. so b before the age, b before five and seven, when the, in, when the internal voice becomes internal, it's all external. Kids self-direct externally. They, they describe their world and they talk to themselves. And it's before five to seven where uh, language has not yet gained control of the motor area of the brain. So a kid can say out loud to themselves, stop, 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 and it won't work. It won't do anything. It's, it's not until that language becomes internal where language gains control over the motor strip of the brain. And here's my favorite quote from Dr. Russell Barkley, the foundation for everything I do is what you say starts to control what you do. So when the internal language finally becomes internal and there's that internal voice, that's when we start to see self-regulation. That's when we see inhibition where we stop ourselves, where kids are able to stop and verbalize, stop and visualize, and are able to make healthy and positive choices in the present because they were able to stop and use their language to self-regulate. Totally. I love it. I love it. And I think I already made a post about this. So I'm just going to like tell anyone who didn't see it. Kudos to everything you've told me. Cause I had this kid who we've been practicing this for only maybe two weeks, you know, just modeling this internal voice and talking to our brain. And it's always, I, I have to tell my brain, don't do that. That's not important right now. We need to do this. She was walking down the hall. She's always distracted and walking the wrong way. And she walked past the bathroom. She told me, I told my brain, even though I needed to go, I told it, no, that's there not go. important right now. And the teacher, I had to go tell the teacher after and she wasn't quite as excited, but I was like, this is big for her. There she you go. Started to the bathroom. Yep. She did not because she, in her head, told her brain, even if she whispered it to herself verbally, I don't care if they do it out loud, eventually it'll get in their head, right? <laughs> that, was, that, that was such an amazing, and, and, and that was like maybe like three days after we talked, that was really soon afterwards. So I you put, you that. put, yeah, you put that to work instantly. And, and I'm, I can tell you that never goes away. I work with college age students that will come back to me the next day and be like, hey, Mike, my brain kept me from doing this. You know, I work with I work with a lot of college age students that are really bad with money management. Like as soon as they get it's like a lot of them work and as soon as they get money, they spend it instantly and they'll come back and say, hey, I talked to my brain. I figured out I don't need to spend this money. I can save it. And I was able to save the money. 
or, you know, in terms of just, you know, playing too many video games. You know, I stopped and I thought about it. I don't need to play Fortnite again. I don't need to play Call of Duty again. I can get some work done. So, and no matter what the age is, they love to talk about their brain coach victories when they talk to their brain and when it improved them because they sense it. They, it makes them feel good about themselves because a lot of these ADHD kids go a long, long time getting negative feedback about their hyperactivity and their inattentiveness. Uh, so when they're able to have those little small victories, you, got, you, you, you have to celebrate. Yes. Let's see. I see another comment here. As a kindergarten educator, this is awesome. I'm going to start this with my students. Nice. There we go. Yes. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's so easy and it benefits everyone. I feel like in this particular context, you know, we're talking about a certain population that we want to help, but it's none reflexive questioning, all of these supports where you're modeling that, you know, your internal voice. Mm -hmm. It's only going to help every single kid, right? That's every, every single person needs this. And, and it's, you know, uh, one thing that I'm sure we were going to get into was sort of the evaluation process. Right. Uh, you know, we as SLPs get so hung up on standardized scores and diagnoses labels. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sad because that's really trickled down into families and parents. And parents now are so concerned about standardized testing and what test was used and what was the score? What's the standard deviation? What's the age equivalent? And we don't want to keep labeling these kids based on test scores. We can't keep doing that. Kid, no kid is a test score, period. And executive, and what a, part of what I love about executive functioning is you can't put a number to it. There will never, ever, ever be a standardized test to measure executive functioning skills, ever. Executive functions will always be parent checklists, teacher tech checklists, uh, self checklists, social observation, school observation, analysis of writing samples. Uh, you know, you can test language, you can test nonverbal skills, all of those things. But your executive functioning is basically your imagination. Are you creating pictures, pictures in your head? Are you talking to yourself? Are you visualizing to yourself? You will never be able to measure that unless some crazy technology comes out. So you, so you really need to be a trained clinician. You have to be able to understand, use the reflexive questioning, get to know your student, build that rapport, build that relationship where they're open and honest and they are listening language and they're coming to you for help and they have the buy-in to the sessions. And, and you'll really be able to individualize those goals and make sure they're fading towards independence. Absolutely. And I'm going to put a plug because I feel like sometimes I think in my head of questions and I hope other maybe practitioners similar to me think of. It's like, oh, this is so frustrating, right? When we see this thing that is so important, yet the standardized measures that we're, requ we're required to use, at least in a school-based setting, aren't helpful for that. But I'm not going to go into detail because I have a post on it. But you can use you giving that test as an informal measure because it takes a lot of executive functioning skills to take a test. And mm. so that standardized evaluation, they can come out totally average in language. But guess what? I got a lot of data seeing how you took that test because those kids aren't just, you know, flip the page. This is the answer. Flip the page. You know, they're distracted or they're, you know, kind of going on a tangent. I mean, not all of these kids, but a lot of the kids that I've evaluated, and you get a lot of information about their executive functioning in a test-taking context because it's not easy. And exactly, exactly. We, we have to provide these certain prompts, and we're like, oh, every kid needs these prompts in testing, but not always. And what happens if they're taking a test independently? No one's prompting them. And so I think if you're going to use the standardized test, Sure, you get a standardized score, but if you're going to give it, get that good informal data from them yes. using executive functioning skills to take that test. I am, a huge, I am a huge, huge fan of, of informal over formal. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, us as SLPs, all of us, you know, we have the training that, you know, it is not easy to become an SLP, period. You know, the amount of training we go through and supervision we go through, we have the, the skills to, to observe a student, observe a classroom. Uh, analyze a writing sample and really see, is there a deficit? You know, can we watch a student and see how they're acting in the classroom, how they're acting with peers and start to, you know, take notes of, of things. And is it happening consistently? Uh, is this an issue? Do parents notice it? Do teachers notice it? Okay, this is something to work on. And you're not going to pick that up on the self or, you know, a language-based test. That's not going to come through. A lot of these tests are pretty basic and you know they may be validated and normed and everything 
but there's a problem with every single standardized test, period. Uh, yes. Yes. We'll say anything <laughs> up yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, let's see. There's a question here. Can you give an example of a reflexive question? You and I, I think I've been going back and forth saying some reflexive reflexive questions but maybe we can say this is what it is and then here's mm -hmm. we'll exactly so reflexive questioning is all about uh having the student sort of reflect on their own images their own experiences and like i said before there's no right or wrong answer so you're asking very basic questions in terms of what did it look like how did you feel uh what were the details uh who were you with what were you doing uh, and it's all about just sort of, you know, having them recall information, having them describe the details. And, you know, they, if they're describing their mental movies and their visual imagery, there's no right or wrong answer. It's really all based on what they were describing. But we as clinicians need to figure out, is this like old grainy, like 80s, 90s TV visual imagery? Or is this 2021 HD pure mental movie? And that's what we're always working towards is having pure high definition mental movies and we figure that out through reflexive questioning exactly so hopefully whoever asked that yeah there you go <laughs> hopefully it's cool. and it's like it's exactly what you said you're helping them reflect on whatever this mental movie is because there's a good chance they're just not reflecting on it and so we have to get them to reflect on it and so i think sometimes in doing that they're able to add to that mental movie because otherwise they just have this very simple if anything and with the reflexive questioning, we're helping them to build that. Exactly. And it's all about repetition, just like, just like what OTs do with fine motor, gross motor, PTs do, all therapies do. We have to do repetition of the skill. Build the skill because as we all know as SLPs, kids are going to master it in the speech session first because you have that rapport, you have that relationship. They're going to do amazing in the speech session. They'll walk out of that room and they'll forget everything. So we have to know exactly what they're doing in various environments. We have to continue doing observation, continue collaborating with teachers and all those sorts of things. Uh, and we need to see really what's, what, what's happening. Is there functional carryover? Are they uh, paying attention more in class? Are they completing homework? Has their missing assignment l list completely shrunk? Are they maintaining friendships? Are they uh, regulating in the classroom? Uh, there's so many, so many various things. Okay, follow up question. This is a good question. So anyone who wasn't here earlier, this is a good question. What is a parent to do when a child has low frustration tolerance with reflexive questions? So that's a so that's a this is a this is a fantastic question. You're absolutely yep. right. So this is a uh, this is a, a common issue. So one thing to always be aware of and one thing that you know, just just looking at reality is, you know, the whole parent child relationship is as dynamic as it gets. So a lot of kids, so for example, uh, you know, like a lot of students will go home after their speech session and mom will say, oh, what'd you learn about in speech? Oh, we did nothing. We just sat there. Oh, how was your school day today? Oh, we did, uh, school was fine. School was fine. Kids, kids and teenagers really, really, really do not like answering their parents' questions. Why? Because they're getting parent questions from the moment they're born for the rest of their life. And that relationship is unbelievably, unbelievably dynamic. When you have parent and child, you have something that I refer to as the unconditional love factor. So kids know they can be at their worst around their parents. They can yell at them when they ask a very basic question. They can refuse to do their chores. They can play video games. They can be at their worst, and they know their parents are going to be there the next day. They know their parents are going to keep loving them and keep giving them what they need to survive and be happy. That's true unconditional love, and that's how it is and how it should be. Uh, when you, we're talking about reflexive questioning, uh, you know, with, between parent and student, you know, you may, if it becomes a serious issue, you may want to find that neutral third party, that speech therapist or another person to ask questions. Sometimes that relationship between uh, parent and child is a little too, you know, rough in terms of self-regulation and they can't get the question out without there being some non-compliance. You may want to have that neutral third party, whether it's a therapist or a family friend or a teacher, whoever it may be, give them the questions to ask and have them report back to you. Or, or you might want to just go back to what I was saying before and sort of using that modeling, you know, model yourself reflecting on things. 
you know, just like how you model your internal voice, you model your brain coach, you know, uh, you know, ask the question out loud to yourself and answer it. And you, and your student and your child doesn't have to respond. They don't have to, you know, have turn it into a back and forth conversation. As long as they hear it and they're uh, exposed to what to what you're saying, you can say, for for example, like, huh, you know, uh, things really, you know, I really felt good about myself when I completed that project. I really, I'm, I'm so happy. I went to the grocery store and I was able to get every single thing I needed. I, when I got to the checkout line, I, I felt so good about myself and I was so impressed uh, that, you know, I don't think I'll have to go back there for another two weeks. And you sort of just sort of just d describe these things out loud and model it. And then, you know, find the right time to use reflexive questioning with, with your child when they're engaged in a preferred task. You know, be very careful about when you're asking them, careful about how you word them. Don't ask too many at once. You know, get a good gauge on your child and, uh, and, and their overall regulation and, you know, f try to throw it in here and there. I love that. I love that whole thing. Yeah, there you that go. The love factor is difficult because it's so real. And I think more than anything, parents are the ones that want to support their kids. And sometimes the best thing you can do is be the parent and provide that unconditional love. Absolutely. A third party. And then guess what? Sometimes you can try yourself but sometimes being the parent is your number one job because no one else can do that exactly and and, and i always tell parents you know they these kids are exposed to so much intervention therapy education clinicians teachers peers all throughout the day the most important thing that you have to do because number one when these kids get home they're exhausted a lot of them hold it together all day at school perform well in front of their peers trying to impress people and trying to work hard, trying to listen, trying to follow through, that when they get home, sometimes they just want to decompress. So the most important things for parents to do is just make sure you have structure in the home and you hold to that structure. You want to have screen time structure. You never want to have open access to an Xbox or a TV or an iPad where it's just there and a kid can pick it up whenever they want. You want to have a set time when they're allowed to play it. You want to have per non-preferred tasks before preferred tasks. You want to make sure your kids get it going outside. You want to make sure that they're exercising. You want to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're doing chores around the house and they have responsibilities, that they're interacting with other peers, and they're not just isolating in their room on, on screens. So, you know, having home structure and screen time structure is your number one priority as a parent. When it comes to reflexive questioning and building these internal skills, you know, I, I, that's something they can certainly take care of at school or with an outside clinician, and they should be good to go. I would agree, because, again, the structure is not something we can give them, and they spend a lot of time at home. So Absolutely. I, it's the whole team approach. That's team. right. That's right. Utilize, utilize, the, utilize the professionals. And uh, a lot of kids these days have, have some really amazing professionals like yourself in their, in their lives. Uh, so, so, you know, maintain that conversation, you know, reach out to your, uh, your, your son or daughter's SLP and let them know about reflexive questioning, let them know about the brain coach mental movies so they can start, uh, adding those things to the therapy. Absolutely. And sometimes I even with the teachers, sometimes you can get that unconditional love thing a little bit, not the same as parents <laughs> yes. successfully and sometimes not. So I was going to say, sometimes I tell people, I'm so excited. I showed a teacher how to do, you know, reflexive questioning and it works, but it's not what size fits all always because it's context-based You and you can't always, you know, it, of not course. Context, but yeah, <laughs> let's see. I'm like, we've got seven minutes. So I'm trying to think, is there anything that instead of going through questions, is there anything that you're like, we haven't hit so-and-so in the last, you know, almost hour that you definitely want to hit or do you want to try to hit a couple more questions? Uh, so we definitely touched on the very basics of the ADHD language connection. So we talked a lot about internal language and the foundation. Uh, there are, there is such a long list of how ADHD is connected to language. Uh, I would recommend to a lot of the SLPs out there listening is you join uh, my Facebook group ADHD for speech language pathologists. 
It's an incredible group. We share research. We have great back and forth conversations. I post a lot of little daily tidbits about the ADHD language connection. If you really want to dive in, I'll be posting a lot of webinars and more videos on there. I think that's a really good way to really empower yourself to be able to treat ADHD and EF with your students. Uh, so, that's, so that's a great recommendation is, is follow that group, ADHD for speech language pathologists. Uh, and, and from there, we can continue to, to learn and, and be able to become that leader on the ADHD team. And I'm taking notes about all the resources that you're listing. And so if everyone's sitting here like, I didn't get that, I'll make like a follow-up post to this live or in the comments of this live, I'll list all of the resources that you've provided. Nice. Because <laughs> uh, if anyone is like me, I just forget, even though it's very important. It's just a lot of information and I'm very excited. So I'll make sure that that Facebook group, which I'm also a part of and love. Yeah, it's a good time. It's a good time in there. We, we have a lot of really great people, a lot of great professionals in there, a lot of SLPs that are already treating ADHD and executive functioning. So it's a great, it's a great resource. Uh, and I, I love posting some of the research that's happening. There's incredible research being done on ADHD because of the increased diagnoses rates. Uh, so it's definitely a, definitely a great group for SLPs uh, because, you know, this is, this is really the future of speech and language pathology. Uh, this, this will definitely be something that's going, going to continue. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at this one question that we, I'm just going to make an executive decision and say we're not going to hit it today because we only have three minutes, but this is an important thing. And maybe it could be a good discussion point for the Facebook group. But this person is saying, what if the school is not giving them the help they need even after trying to advocate to get them the support? I feel like you are not the only one in this situation. So I'm like, are you okay if I direct a question like this to your Facebook group? Because I think a lot of people might. That's a great question for the Facebook group. You know, very quickly, the, you know, the, the short answer to that is to get an outside evaluation. Get an outside evaluation. Don't go based off of the, the RR done by the school. Go and find a private clinician, get an outside evaluation. But yeah, uh, I'm sure there's many, many parents in the Facebook group uh, who are also SLPs that have been in that exact same situation. This is a common issue in today's education. So yeah, we'll post that to the group and, and we'll, we'll get some good answers. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to make the most of the two and a half minutes we have. So yeah. if I had another hour, we could have a good discussion on that. But I liked your quick answer. Find an outside an evaluation because they can provide more support. Wow, we have like two minutes and I think we covered most of the questions that people had anyway. And if I didn't cover your question, I'm sorry, but we can be DM'd. Yes, yes, <laughs> definitely. A lot of these questions, because they're all very good questions and you just, we can't answer them all in an hour. Sadly. Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I love when a lot of the viewers of the uh, these Instagram lives and a lot of the podcasts that I do that send me these private DMs. You guys can uh, DM me on, on, on Instagram, Grow Now Therapy, just Grow Now Therapy, one word. Uh, feel free to shoot me a DM, ask any questions. I love to help you guys out and, and also uh, get to know these fellow SLPs and uh, anything I can do to help you guys. That's exactly how Callie and I met. Uh, and, you know, just, just chatting and, and getting to know each other and sharing ideas. And I've learned a ton from her. She's learned a ton from me back and forth. So whatever we can do to get, get to know each other and help each other, shoot me a DM on Instagram. Uh, you can follow me on, on uh, my website uh, is grownowtherapy.com. So check out my website, check out my Instagram, and we can keep the conversation going. And even if you're a timid person and you're not quite ready to make the jump in DM people, everything on his Instagram page is very helpful and you can like, it's things that you can apply tomorrow, which is what I love. So if you're awesome. DM right now, if you don't have a specific question right now, I'm sure that you'll have questions after you scroll through the feed because it's enlightening. It's like PD for. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Do you have anything else you want to say? I was like, we've got like 45 seconds. It's telling me I've got 45 seconds left. <laughs> Well, we had some really, like, I, I recognize a lot of the names of people popping in and out, a couple of uh, families I work with, a even a couple of my students popped on for a second there. That was really, really good. That was really, really nice of them. So a big shout out to them if they're still listening. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank everyone for, you know, spending your Wednesday with us and, you know, we can keep doing this. So send us your questions. Uh, and I know Callie and I have nothing better to do, but keep doing Instagram lives. So, uh, so, so well, hey, this is, it's a lot of fun. 
Well, perfect. In that case, you now know how to find Michael and you now know my Instagram page since you got here. And thanks everyone for coming. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks for having me.